So, the one, the only, and one of the smartest white men on this side of heaven, my friend Bill Lockwood is here. My friend, your friend, Bond friend, everybody friend is here. Bill Lockwood, writer and radio host at host at American Liberty with Bill Lockwood. He's also a teacher in Wichita Falls, Texas, preacher at Our Park Church of Christ. And uh, I want to talk to Bill about all this mess going on in our country today. I wanted to ask him about Woodrow Wood, Wood, Wilson, and because I've been hearing a lot of little things about him lately. Bill, good morning. Thank you for coming on. Good morning, Jesse. How are you today? All is well, sir. Happy Men's History Month. August is Men's History Month. All right. I'm, I'm happy for that, even though it's the last day of August here. Or I'm coming <laughs> up to it. But uh, anyway, yeah, thank you for that. Thank you for celebrating those things. Absolutely. You know, Bill, I... Uh, I want to ask you about Woodrow Wilson, but first, um, what do you think about all this mess that's happening right now? What are you? What are you seeing? What do you? I mean, what? How do you see everything? Well, you know what? Um, I think we're on the last leg of America, really. But I, I have, I have uh, on the uh, on my radio show, I've called for the impeachment of the president. It needs to, he needs to be impeached, and. Um, you know what? We just need to have people with backbone to do that. It's, I think this is uh, what's happening in Afghanistan is is treason. If it's not treason, I don't I don't know what the definition of treason would be. Uh, giving Afghans ninety billion dollars worth of military equipment and arms, at the same time leaving Americans behind and pulling out. And um, but the globalists have been at this for a long, long time, and this is exactly the same song second verse as we've done in and maybe third fourth verse as we've done in vietnam and other places so um but I, it's so dismaying uh, to see the, the character of america absolutely eroded by what's taking place in the biden administration so with that going on overseas and uh, the, the 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 shot mandates taking place in america it just you know the unconstitutional it's very very sad the open borders where they're just flooding america with foreigners and uh, you know it, we can't we can't last as a nation as a free nation if this is going to be the case. So we better do something about it. When you say you believe it's the end of America, what do you mean by that? As a free nation, I believe we're basically a socialistic country already. But as a free nation, uh, as people who enjoy freedom and are able to do uh, what the God has given us the ability to do, uh, make and earn our own livings and have our families. Uh, without the intrusiveness of government, uh, without the manipulation of our uh, educational system and brainwashing of our children, uh, without uh, heavy-duty taxation up to 50% of the taxations that's going on in our country for the middle class, uh, protecting our borders, protecting our homes, protecting our communities, uh, instead of unleashing the, the hordes of illegals as well as hordes of people who are just running amok in our streets and the violence that is occurring, um, you know, we, we can't, uh, all we're going to do is have to hold up in our homes. And, uh, and you know what next is coming? Of course, they're going to be shutting preachers down. So um, the preachers better start thinking about that. They're, they're going to be, I think we're going to be at house worship, homes worshiping. Uh, it may be in my lifetime because, uh, you know, they're, they're the, 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 the deep state is really after everything conservative. So I, I think that's the end of America as we know it. I saw a report the other day where, the government told tenants that they don't have to pay homeowners rent. They don't have to pay their rent. And now right. a lot of, there are several people who own property uh, that are now losing their properties because even though, according to the report, most people can still pay rent, they're not paying because the government told them they didn't have to. And so they're causing right. citizens so that- to lose their property. Right. Of course, the government has no business doing that kind of thing, but it's destroying the free market. It's destroying uh, the freedom that we have in our country. The free market is, is simply the idea that we have the ability to buy and sell and to, and to carry on trade uh, freely with uh, private contracts as I wish to do. But if I, the government's stepping in and telling me my private contract is no good, 
you know, we, we, we're not free. We're not a free people if the government has the ability to do that and does do that. That's exactly what's happening. I was over at the post office yesterday, and they had a, you could walk into the mailbox portion of the post office, but if you want to go in and, deal, you know, uh, mail out a box or deal with the clerk, they had a sign at the door that said, and that was a long line, but they had a sign that says, out, out to lunch until 2 o'clock or something like that. And so I asked the lady, what do you mean out to lunch? I've never seen the post office shut down for lunch. And the lady yeah. said, <laughs> one of the workers said, well, that's what happens when people don't show up for work. She told me that they only had one clerk at work yesterday because everybody else refused to come because they were getting paid by the government. They get a free money, so they don't show up to work anymore at the post office. Right. We have a Leviathan government that is paying people not to work. And that, that is the same scenario all across the country, Jesse. And it is so, so sad uh, that we have allowed this socialist uh, administration in Washington, D.C. to take over and to push this socialistic agenda. And uh, that's, of course, uh, you know, I have, I have very little patience any longer with the, with the people who have been supportive of the Democratic and the Biden administration because uh, we warned them, we've been warning them, I've been warning, and as you have too, for most of your adult life, uh, that this was the direction we're headed and this is what Biden has planned and this is what he wants to do. But people would not listen. Instead, they wanted to have cliches such as riding with Biden. And now, now, we're, now we're in real, real, real trouble. And, um, but, you know, I, so I, I'm losing patience with people who, who refuse to inform themselves on what really is occurring in our nation. Um, I told, I said to the lady there, I said, well, this is, this is going to get worse because you have the Democrats in control. And this is just an example of things to come if you don't change it. So vote for Larry Elder. And Larry is uh, yes. running for governor in California. And she's like, no. I'm a Democrat. I can't vote for Larry. I'm like, what? No. <laughs> yeah, you like Democrat. Okay, Being a Democrat is believing in God or something, you know? You know what? That is so, so sad. Larry Elder is such a great man, a great conservative constitutionalist. And, you know, uh, but, you know, that, that whole lie about I'm a Democrat, I've got to vote a Democrat. That this, is, this is the mindset that is so shallow. It is as shallow as, a, as the second and third grade. And, I, you know, I've got to vote Democrat because this, I'm, I'm a Democrat. It just, you know, <laughs> it was it's the same thing lady. regarding Republicans. I'll say it's the same thing regarding Republicans. We don't need to vote Republican because I'm a Republican. There are many Republicans that are neocons, which are really socialists, and they have accepted the New Deal of FDR a long, long time ago. And so it's the same thing with the Republicans. So you better start examining the persons for whom you're voting. Yeah. One last thing about that, uh, my producer said Nick went over to DMV, and they had one person in the booth for more than almost an hour and a half, if not more. And so it's just getting worse. So let me ask you this, and I want to ask you about Woodrow Wilson. Um, most young people, adults, millennials, disease, and most young people do not know about the Constitution. They don't know about morality. They're not, they're not aware that they're losing freedom. How would this ever change if they don't know about it? About the Constitution well, or you know anything. What? They don't know they're losing freedom. Right. You know what? Our, our founding fathers would say with one voice, as they did, that our, our country is built upon the concept of morality, God-given rights, and the concept of having moral uh, moral certitude and and moral and integrity and in persons and in your and in your leadership must be the case if you're going to maintain freedom in a nation so john adams would say it this way he says if we cannot maintain freedom he says there is i mean maintain morality then there is no set of laws there's no constitution that will work and maintain freedom it will not work unless we maintain morality yeah. He says, our Constitution is made only for a moral and religious people. It will not work for any other. That's exactly where we are. And so when I was growing up and you were growing up, it was taught in the school, in the homes and the schools. It was talked about in churches. It's morality and Constitution is no longer talked about for the most part. And since they don't know about 
the Constitution. They don't know about freedom. They don't know about morality. There's no way to, uh, except of a miracle from God. They don't know how to, they don't know, it won't change since they don't know what they're losing. That's exactly right. The same thing as you talk about frequently regarding the family. If, unless people have more integrity in their hearts and, and are turning to God in repentance and becoming what God wants us to be, then there's no hope for the family. Yeah. There's not going to be any, there's not going to be any integrity in a husband and wife. There's not going to maintain that kind of relationship. And it's not going to work unless we actually turn to God. And so is it over already? Are we now a uh, socialist country? Because I've noticed that the one thing that the government and others have done is convince women that they are equal to men, and they have educated the women. And now the women don't want to stay home and raise the man children. They want to be at work and acting, pretending to be men. And they are sacrificing the man's children to critical race theory, to... Uh, uh, radical homosexuality and lesbian, they are sacrificing the children, even with this Chinese virus situation. Most parents are upset, not because uh, of the Chinese virus, but because they had to stay home and watch over the children. And so they're rather sending yeah. children back to school, yeah. even with a mask or being vaccinated before they have to stay home and be a mother. Yes, that is so sad, and that's that's where we are. That's a selfish, selfish nation right there. Yeah, and that's that's one. Yeah, that's one reason why we we cannot last as we are. First of all, I, I would say this: I believe we're already socialistic. We don't have a full blown socialist system of medicine in place yet, but they have Republicans and Democrats have been working on that for a long, long time, and they're about to push it over the goal line here. But uh, that, but we are basically a socialist nation. I mean, in, in what area? Has the government not intruded? In what area? Right. I can't. I, I can't think of one area. Yeah. They they tell you how much water you can have in your toilet in the bathroom. They can tell you what kind of what kind of cars you're going to drive. They're going to tell you uh, how many hours you're going to go to school and and whether or not you can be paid when you go to your job and how many hours you must work and how many how much overtime you must have and they're going to tell employers and employees what they must do and it just it goes on and on and on they tell you to put your seatbelt on in the car yeah. and, i mean where are we not a socialist i don't understand where people think we're not socialist and we've we've been talking about progressivism for a long time but that's really basically a code word for socialism that's what it is socialism and i'm starting to understand bill that this is not an overnight thing this thing has been this socialism uh, has been in operation, been in plan for a long time. It didn't just happen overnight. And I want to ask you about the 28th president of the United States of America, Woodrow Wilson. And um, I've been hearing little things about him. I don't know much about Woodrow, because, you know, whatever, right? Um, was he tied, Woodrow Wilson tied to communism? He was a socialist. He was basically indeed a socialist and he favored, uh, he, he favored the big hand of government and he basically took a Marxist position in philosophy. So if we, let's step back, uh, even back to the Theodore Roosevelt period, which is prior to Woodrow Wilson at the turn of the century. And Theodore Roosevelt took the position, and by the way, this has everything to do with, with the Bible as well. I want to think about this. The founding fathers in the establishing our constitution took the position as our constitution basically states over and over again, that the federal government can only do what it is authorized to do by means of the constitution. So that's a limited government. The federal government can only do what is authorized by the constitution because we, the people give it to the federal government to do. Along came people such as Theodore Roosevelt, who took an opposite position. They wanted presidential Oval Office power. So consequently, he took the position and stated it bluntly and plainly in print. And he stated, he says, I refuse to accept the dictum that we must do only what the Constitution authorizes. My position, said Theodore Roosevelt, is we may do what it does not forbid us from doing. We may do whatever it does not tell us we specifically cannot do. Well, he wanted that for power. Now, that's the same thing that's happening, uh, has happened in apostasy with biblical Christianity. 
The Bible teaches exactly the same thing, and that is we must only do what is authorized by the New Testament. That's Colossians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, as well as other passages. But nevertheless, many people today take the position we may do what God has not specifically forbidden us to do. Uh, well, that's exactly what Theodore Roosevelt said about the Constitution. So now that then along comes Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson was an uh, uh, academia, a man of academia at Princeton University. He bought into the Marxist worldview of what is called historical materialism and basically stated that historical events or hi history is actually the sole contributor to a man's behavior. Now think about that for a moment. <laughs> Karl Marx basically stated the economic status in which you were born is the sole determining factor of your behavior, economics. Woodrow Wilson took exactly the same position, but turned it a little bit differently along with others in that school of thought and said, the historical situation in which we live is the sole determining factor of your behavior. So in other words, there was no God-given concepts, no God-given rights, and it was not about uh, the integrity that we have apart from the historical situation in which we live. So that means he was a materialist, and that was, of course, basically atheistic. So when he would quote the Declaration of Independence, Woodrow Wilson left out rights under God. He would let, leave out the statements regarding God and, and so forth in the Declaration. And he would just he would just gloss over, just like people do today who don't yeah. want to appreciate God. Yeah. So Woodrow Wilson indeed was a big government man. He was a man who was basically um, a materialist. He was atheistic in his basic views of the world, which takes on a different coloring entirely. He wanted, and he lamented the fact that the Constitution restrained the office of the president and, and the president was bound to do only what Congress wanted him to do. And he says, I refuse to be bound that way. He did not want that. As a matter of fact, he had another person who was his right-hand man, and that was Edward Mandel House. I don't know if you've heard of Edward Mandel House or not. He was actually from Texas, and he was a, a scion of uh, big oil and so forth. But Edward Mandel House was a socialist, basically a Marxist, and he wanted, uh, and he actually made overtures to Wilson, and he saw Wilson uh, in some of the uh, gubernatorial races and so forth, and he latched on with Wilson. They became fast friends, and he became his uh, Wilson's sidekick and his shadow. Edward Mandel House wrote a book in 19, um, I think it was 1910, called Philip Drew Administrator, in which he says, we want to establish socialism in America as dreamed of by Karl Marx. We want to establish the income tax, that is taxing people's income. We want to establish, and he went through a list of things such as a social security and government manipulation. And so he went through the whole thing, but socialism as dreamed of by Karl Marx is exactly how he put it. Wilson was his man. And so Wilson and Edward Mandel House actually orchestrated uh, several things in order, number one, I think, to manipulate us into World War I, but also to give us big government, and uh, and also they to set up what was called, they thought it was, we call it today the United Nations, but the League of Nations, which was world government, internationalism, under a socialistic system. And that's exactly what House wanted, and so he pushed for it. Wilson, however, was opposed by several senators, and it did not come to fruition. The League of Nations... Uh, did not actually happen, and so, uh, but anyway, there's more to the story of it, but that's, that's Wilson's legacy. He was basically a Marxist, an atheist in his worldview, and he pushed for big government, and he wanted authoritarian uh, dictatorship from the presidential office, and he pushed that way. Amazing. What year was it's he? long answer. Sorry no, that. I love that. Thank you. What year was he president of the United States? Let's see. Um, <clears throat> I think Wilson was, uh, <clears throat> what was it, 19, um, 1912, I believe he was elected, and in 1913. As a matter of fact, in 1913, Wilson was able to engineer and shepherd through Congress as and, and cramming through several things that had been planned by globalists for a long time. Number one, the Federal Reserve System. He wanted to have the Federal Edward Mandel House had written about it already in his book, Philip Drew Administrator, talking about a banking system to manipulate the currency. So they, so one of the first things that Woodrow Wilson did in 1913, he helped cram through, which had already been on the drawing board in secret meetings at Jekyll Island. He'd pushed through the Federal Reserve System. 
this enabled Jesse the the proliferation of socialism in our nation because it allows us to deficit spend and and steal the money from the American people stealth by stealth by them not even knowing it by removing it by by simply manipulating the currency and expanding the currency base and so the Federal Reserve system it was a it's a manipulative system it's a lie because it's not federal they don't have any reserves they've never been audited they refuse to be audited and so that's exactly what so the Federal Reserve number one 1913 number two he wanted to have the income tax and so he crammed through he helped cram through the 16th amendment through Congress to start a tax in incomes which was a lie to begin with our founding fathers rejected taxing people's income but he wanted it to be put in there they wanted it just to get small increments so they got it started saying you would never be taxed more than one one thousandth of what you have and only the very rich are going to be taxed and blah 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 and all that lie <laughs> And so then they, of course, they built on it. Yeah. And then the 17th Amendment, which was the direct election of senators, which was to move us away from a, a, the states. And the senators were elected by the states to protect states' rights. And Wilson despised states' rights. He wanted a central, strong government. And so the 17th Amendment, so those three measures, income tax, the Federal Reserve, and the 17th Amendment, 16th Amendment, 17th Amendment, Federal Reserve, those three, and they put us on the road to socialism. It's where we are today. What a mess. And so <laughs> <laughs> the League of Nations is now the United Nations. Today it's the United Nations. That's true? That's correct. That's correct. So the League of Nations, they established it without United States involvement because there were several senators that were apprised of what was going on. Um, and Wilson, his own... Um, his own pride kind of got in the way and he pushed it and pushed it and he didn't want to back off. Edward Mandel House told him to compromise, get it in, the, get it done. We can add to it later. But Wilson was one of these arrogant cusses who said, you know what? Uh, they don't listen to the president. And he pushed and pushed and pretty soon it got people against the League of Nations. And so it did not go, go through. So Edward Mandel House instead went and he split ways with Wilson and he went and set up two organizations to push us to international world government. And number one was the Council on Foreign Relations, which was the United States, which was set up after World War II. And number two was the Royal Institute of International Affairs, the uh, companion organization in, in England. And all of these individuals, by the way, are socialists. They were known as Fabian socialists. That's exactly what they are. That is incrementing, uh, incremental, uh, incrementalism is getting socialism established. And that's exactly what Edward Mandel House did. So after, but he had another man, Franklin Roosevelt, pushed us into World War II. And immediately after that, what did we get? We got the United Nations, which the League of Nations turned all, all over its assets to it. And, we, and it's, it became actually uh, the, the embryo of world government. And that's where we are today. Amazing. Was Woodrow Wilson a Christian? Do you know? Uh, you know what he made? I, I don't know about his uh, Christian beliefs, really. I know that he made uh, several comments about them, but you know what? The, what they make publicly uh, and what they are yeah. privately, those, those, those kind of guys, are two different things. For example, Woodrow Wilson was promising all the while to keep American boys out of war. At the very same time, he had already promised England and France through Edward Mandel House that he was going to get us into World War I. The same play, the second scene takes place with FDR who did exactly the same thing, promising we would never get our boys into foreign wars, while at the same time he had already promised foreign nations we were going to get into the war and manipulate America into that war. So that's what Woodrow Wilson was about. It was duplicitous and it was, it was all... Um, I mean, it was all lies, and so what he believed personally regarding religion, I think he would say things in order for people to accept it, uh, that ex accept him. Yeah. And besides that, uh, liberalism had affected Christianity to a heavy, uh, to a, a heavy degree, even in the late uh, decades of the 19th century. So Christianity itself had begun to turn socialist in a lot of ways, and so we have a lot of what were called social justice warriors even back then they called it the social gospel such as walter Rauschenbusch, who wanted to turn the gospel of christ into a social a social justice idea amazing 
I I was going to ask, America is a Christian nation, Christian country. Uh, back in those days, I was under the impression that Christian was stronger and wiser and tend to operate in the order. Why did they allow this to happen back then? Was it because they were being deceived and didn't know it, or why did they allow Woodrow and Theodore Roosevelt and others to do this? Well, you, you know what? Christianity, um, reach, reaching back even to oh, the Franklin Reformation Roosevelt. period. Franklin Roosevelt, I'm sorry, not Theodore, but Franklin Roosevelt. Well, reaching back even to the, to the Reformation period, coming out of the Reformation years, people were very, very conservative, religiously speaking. And the different, different denominations were very, very conservative in the so-called Christian world. And very conservative, and they believed in the, in the verbal, word-for-word -word inspiration of the Scriptures, which the Bible does actually teach in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13, and other passages. But be that as it may, they're very conservative. However, there were many, many people in that era, uh, coming out of that era, that were very, very, uh, very, very liberal in their views of the Bible. And so they, so in the, in the different seminaries, and for, particularly from the schools in Germany, they took a very different position regarding the Bible. And that is they took the position that the Bible was only uh, composed by uninspired men. And so their goal has been to dis determine uh, the history of the text and see how the text developed and so forth. And so they attacked the inspiration of the Bible so heavily, and this was held up as great scholarship. So this came into America, and it was in America in the 1830s, 1840s, but it really took off after Charles Darwin published The Origin of the Species in 1859, which basically tells us that man is the result of evolutionary development and did not, was not created in God's image, as the book of Genesis tells us. So many churches had already had already been the, you know, the hearts of the churches have been eaten out already by these great big liberal professors who refused to believe the inspiration of the text and did not believe in that Jesus Christ was the son of God resurrected from the dead so forth they didn't believe that but they were heads of churches so now all of this liberalism impacting the churches and then that's what you have coming out of in the, in the 1880s 1890s and, and at the turn of the century, and Wilbur Wilson was a product of, the, of these things, and Princeton University took off on this kind of a direction. Let me take a quick break, Bill. I'll be right back. 888-7753. Talking to Bill Lockwood. Wood, back in a moment. All right, folks, welcome back. Talking to Bill Lockwood. And uh, Bill, tell the folks how to... Uh, get to your YouTube channel, your radio show, and all the good things you're doing because there is so much that they can learn that we have forgotten in this country, especially with the millennials. How can they get to your YouTube, your radio show, riding the, I mean, riding the horse for, the, for Jesus and all that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you for that. Well, the, the two YouTube channels are uh, Riding for the Bible Brand and, the, and uh, that's, of course, just a short eight-minute Bible lesson. So that's, that's pretty simple to watch on that one. And the other one is American Liberty with Bill Lockwood. That's a YouTube channel, and that's where they, the shows, the radio shows that I have are posted. We're a little bit behind in posting some of them. So, uh, But the radio show is exactly the same name, American Liberty with Bill Lockwood. Uh, the website's named that. Uh, it's a dot-com address, and there are articles on there by a lot of people. And, uh, but also the, the radio show is American Liberty with Bill Lockwood, and that's out of Wichita Falls, and it's aired Saturdays at 11 a.m. Amazing. As well as Lubbock and Adelaide. Absolutely. Um, one final question, I think, and then I want to at least squeeze in one call for you because of time here. Um, so the U.S. military, quote, unquote, had left Afghanistan, and what what mm. is being reported, and we would I don't know if we would ever know the whole truth because the government, the media, everybody just lying to us now, deliberately lying. And, but what it seems is that they have weakened the military to a point now that we are seen around the world as a weak military and that uh, the world is not trusting America anymore. We are not the light of the world anymore. Um, is that deliberate 
so that they can usher in socialism? I, I believe it is deliberate. So, so the the military, I want to, and I do want to make clarification here. The military people, the people, the the rank and file personnel, uh, the the leaders that are that are the local leaders and so forth. They're, these are great and the great Americans, and they're just yeah. just wonderful, strong people. And these military individuals, I have the highest esteem and respect for. However, the policies that guide the military have weakened us, and those policies are coming out of Washington, D.C., inclusive of the Pentagon, which has become so uh, politicized itself. So in the top brass of the military, that's a different story. There, it's all political appointment, apparently. Political appointments and political ideas and political going along with the president of the United States and the internationalism that we're involved in and have been for a long time. So that's why we lost Vietnam. It's not because our soldiers are no good. It's not because our armies are not equipped. It's not because we don't have great battlefield leaders on the ground. It's because in Washington, D.C., and sometimes in the halls of the Pentagon and other places at the world government, United Nations headquarters, we are governed by those dictates that absolutely hamstring our military, tie their hands behind their back and say, go fight a war. That's what we did in Vietnam and we lost it. And when we left there, we left millions of dollars of weaponry in the hands of the NVA. We're doing exactly the same thing today with Afghanistan. Why is that the case? Not because our military military personnel has any blame, but because of the top brass and the politicization of the Pentagon, as well as the White House, has absolutely hamstrung our military. And they're now taking our military and utilizing them to take foreigners from different places on the border and carting them around the country. Yeah. Has nothing to do with the protection of our borders, nothing to do with the protection of America. And it's so sad to see the treason that is taking place. And I, I say it exactly what I know I'm saying. It's treasonous what's taking place in the White House and even to the, in some points to the, in the Pentagon. Amazing. And you said that you're calling for the impeachment of Joe Biden. If they would do that, wouldn't we end up with that shallow, evil woman, um, whatever her name is, the so-called vice president? Yeah. What's her name? Camilla Harris. You know Harris. what? You know what? So what? We need. It's time that we kick them in the shin a little bit. It's time that they had felt a little bit of. I, I, I personally, this is my personal opinion. I grew tired of thinking, well, we got someone worse coming down down the line next. Right. You know, maybe if we put some teeth into some of our actions, maybe they would take think twice about doing the nasty things they're doing. But we need. To, I can't even. We need to get rid of Joe Biden. He needs to be impeached. And the Republicans need to stand up and do it and quit saying, well, we'll have Kamala Harris next. Well, impeach her too then. Yeah. And then if Nancy yeah. Pelosi comes up there, impeach her too. But no one's going to start doing anything if you don't spank the oldest child, then yet the middle child's not going to behave either. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> do we have anyone in so-called leadership that is capable of even starting something like that or discussing it? You mean in Congress? Right, Congress, somewhere in the country. Do we have anyone? I believe so. Like who? Well, you know what? There were some 80 some odd uh, commanders and admirals who signed a letter recently uh, chastising uh, President Biden, as well as calling for the resignation of General Milley just the other day. There are a lot of people who re were retired, whom Obama forced out of office, I know personally some of them myself, and I think they're, they're men enough to do it. But you know what? They don't get a voice because the media shuts yeah. them down. They don't, they don't have a voice. We have two or three people in Congress who are strong enough, but you have to be a pretty strong person in Congress to do it. And we only have two or three that are really strong enough to do that. Yeah. They're, and they're, they're usually Republicans, but most Republicans are too weak. Amazing. Amazing stuff, Bill. Bill, I want to, <laughs> do you mind taking a, at least a couple calls here? No, I don't mind at all. That'd be great. Okay. Julian is out of North Carolina. Uh, Julian, welcome to the show. You're on with Bill Lockwood. Hey, how's it going, Jesse? How's it going, Bill? All is well. Hey, Julian, you how are you? Okay? Yes, sir. 
All right, I was listening to your conversation and an interesting um, uh, thought came to mind uh, that you, uh, w well, referring to what you said that we might already be a socialist, socialist society, I, I think I do agree with that. But, um, and like Jesse said, this is something that I think has happened over time. It didn't just happen, you know, uh, yesterday, right? Uh, but right. I have this... I have a question. I wanted. I wanted to know what your what your thoughts was. Do you think that socialism was already kind of introduced because of the advancement of technology that it was already just inevitable? Because I notice as as more technology becomes advanced, it seems like socialism just kind of it kind of seems more imminent because technology seems to be designed, or at least by design, to make life easier and more accessible. And when I think about what communism and what socialism stands for, it's basically sacrificing freedoms for a more easier and accessible life. And so what's your, go right to your question, uh, Julia. My question is, do you, do you think that technology played a big role, or the advancement of technology played a big role in the, usher, in the ushering in the socialistic ideas? Uh, because capitalism seems what to be more that, obstacle. Bill? Sorry, go ahead. You know, that's a good, yeah, that's a good question, Julie. And you know what? I, I do believe that not necessarily it was inevitable, but that technology uh, back in the day was the telephone and, uh, and air travel and that kind of thing. And uh, so those, th those platforms uh, enabled the government to step in there and want to control everything from a federal level and so they trampled the Constitution, specifically the Interstate Commerce Clause. Uh, they utilized the Interstate Commerce Clause to, to manipulate or manage the, the Federal Communications Commission, to manage the telephones, to manage the telegraph, everything that has to do with it, which, which communication, for example, think about communication, Julian. Communication is that... I mean, is that a federal, should it be a federally controlled system? But see, the Interstate right. Commerce Clause simply simply said, you know, if we're going to, if we're going to trade goods from Texas to, to Oklahoma, then we're not going to be able to put tariffs on the material coming into Oklahoma from, from Texas and vice versa. But now they're using it for communication and for telephones and telegraphs and railways and that kind of thing and travel and and so it, I do think that they utilized it, but I don't believe it was inevitable. I believe they trampled the Constitution by doing so. And the Constitution, the Founding Fathers put so many roadblocks and stop gaps in there. And here's one, one thing I told a, a friend of mine the other day, Julian. The, the Constitution, they, he, he made the comment, he said, well, the Constitution was for a, a people that was a farming people, a, a gregarian society. However, the Founding Fathers foresaw the progress of America, and they said, if you want to change the Constitution, here's how you do it. You add amendments to it. You don't simply trample it and say, ignore it. You simply amend it. But our, our leaders politically refused to amend it. They simply trampled it and ignored it, and, and this is what we have. Amazing. Thank you, Julian. Uh, Julian asked a different question than what I thought he, what I was told he was going to ask. He wanted to know Originally, I thought he wanted to know, was capitalism useless now? Is capitalism useless? No, I don't. no ca capitalism is simply freedom. <laughs> capitalism is my freedom. My freedom to sell to you and your freedom to buy from me and vice versa. That's capitalism. That has nothing to do. That, that, that's, that is not outmoded. I mean, I, I, have, I should have the freedom. Capitalism means freedom. That's and interesting. I am free. Yeah. That's interesting because I think when most people think of capitalism, they think of material things. They don't necessarily think of it as freedom. Right. Well, it, it involves material possessions as and, and buying and trailing, selling and bartering. It's interesting that Karl Marx himself was the one who came up with capitalism as a as a to give it an ugly taint because he wanted, of course, it to be centrally controlled from the federal government as is going on now. That's what Karl Marx wanted. So he called it capitalism. It's all you all about, all you all is about money. No, it's not about money. It's not about possessions. It's about freedom. I it's love about that. freedom to buy. Yeah. 
buy, sell, trade, and to fail. If I don't have the freedom to fail, then I don't have the freedom. But that's what we're disallowing in schools. That's what we're disallowing in the marketplace. That's what the President Biden is disallowing. He's giving people all these stimulus checks. If you don't have freedom to fail, you don't have freedom. Yeah. And so that's what capitalism involves. Amazing. Uh, it appears that Joe Biden doesn't know he's even president. Uh, he remind me. <laughs> he remind me of my father. Well, he won't mind if we impeach him, then will he? Right. That's right. <laughs> he won't mind if we impeach. Him. Okay, that's good. That's great. Okay, good. <laughs> because he reminded me of my father. I don't know what's wrong with him or if his name's wrong, but he reminds me of my father when he first developed Alzheimer's. He just uh -huh. stares at you know things, and for a while he repeats what someone tell him or told him, and eventually my father just forgot everybody. And Joe Biden seemed to be yeah. traveling down that same path as though he doesn't really know he's the president. I think you're right. It looks it looks that way. But sadly, we knew that before he was elected. Yeah, that was exactly what we saw. And people still voted for him. And I just think, well, you 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 ask for it, you're going to get it. And this is a, this is what we get when we just don't pay attention what really is going on. Um, is it Mick? Mick, a first time caller out of Tampa, Florida. Mick, you are with Bill Lockwood. Real fast, thank you for calling. Miss, Mr. Lockwood, thank you for educating us. I hope that a lot of young people are listening today because as a 50-year-old man uh, indoctrinated in the school system, this was completely hidden from us and was shown to us that, hey, America the Great will never fail because of this and that. But Marxist has always been play in place since, I would say, maybe the 40s. I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but I hope that a lot of young people in America are listening today and step up and do something, because if not, we are going to lose the Constitution, and we are going to lose America to all these liberals, these morons that don't believe in God, which this country was founded on God. So I want to thank you for your hey. services, and uh, Mr. Peterson, you as well. You guys are heaven sent. God bless you both. Thank you, Mick. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Mick. Appreciate that, Mick. Yeah. So, Bill, in our final word here today, what are the steps, if you know, to turning this around? Because we still have time to do it. It's not over. What are the steps yeah. to turn it around? Well, number one, we better be on our knees praying. Uh, and we better be praying to God that we might be able to be spared in, and in his wrath, remember mercy, as Habakkuk prayed in chapter 3, verse 1. In your wrath, remember mercy, because uh, we have done so much wickedness in America. Uh, we have um, implemented, of course, abortions and, and murdering over a million babies a year. And that is uh, well known. And so... Not only that, but we've instituted homosexuality, and Romans chapter 1 tells us that God gives up a society where that takes place. So we, we're really on borrowed time as a nation. So I think, number one, we better be on our knees. Number two, we better be, we better be faithful in attendance at churches. We better be faithful in worshiping God, and we better be going to the houses of worship and praying. Not just at the end of like Victory Day, V-Day, after the end of World War II, where everybody went to the churches and prayed and thanked God for victory. We better be going to the churches and praying to God and turning our lives over to God and praying to him that we might be able to be maintained a little bit longer in our freedom. Otherwise, we're going to go the rest of the, the way of all the earth. And that's how it's going to go down. And we're going to lose all of our rights, even though we're giving $90 billion worth of material and weapons to the Afghans. Uh, to the Taliban, and Biden is trying to take away our Second Amendment rights here, which is a right before God that we have a right to our own our own lives and defending our own lives. Um, so we better be careful about these things and be informed on what's happening and get hold of our senators and tell them, get embolden them, say, let's. Why are you not putting up articles of impeachment on the, these things? People need to rise up in America on what's happening in Afghanistan. It's just absolutely an atrocity. I just cannot understand if we can't get hold of our senators. And if we don't impeach him on this, and then that, we can't impeach on anything. I know. <laughs> you know. I'm stunned at how they left Afghanistan and just left American citizens there.
You know, they just went oh. home. Okay, uh, y'all try to make it the best way you can. We're out of here. I, I never thought yeah. I would see it so blatantly done where they just leave American citizens there and go home. You know, Franklin Roosevelt himself stated many, many years ago, he says, in politics, nothing happens by accident. This is not accidental. It's not something that, well, we just made a few miscalculations. This was planned, and it has been planned all the while. We are, we are actually cutting the throats of our own people and our own allies across the world, and that's what Biden's up to. We better get rid of him, and we better be, we better be changing of, of the government of America and getting back to a constitutional basis very, very quickly, and we're, we're done. I was thinking the only way they could get away with leaving American citizens there, it must have been all white people because I can't see <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, <laughs> in America, it might have been Jesse Lee Peterson's over there too, though. <laughs> <laughs> in America today, it's okay to attack white people or do whatever you want to them. So I'm thinking it must have been only white people that was over there. They left there because I can't see them leaving people of color over there. They they don't. They seem to love the people of color more than they love white people. Well, I guess uh, people of color, such as yourself and Larry Elder, men like that, uh, th you're not actually really people of color. I guess you're just uh, white with the, I don't know what they yeah. call you, but, you know, yeah. I guess you're white. We we're, so. we're the black faces of white supremacy. Oh, oh okay, yeah, that's right, yeah. yeah. Carol Swain's one of the same thing, you know, Carol Swain, they called her a white supremacist, you know, yeah. it's just like, oh, my. Yeah. yeah, that's right. So there may have been a few of those white supremacists in black skin over there, too. I don't know. <laughs> Amazing. So, Bill, once again, tell the folks how to get all of your information, listen to your show, and all the good things. Sure. Thank you, Jesse. It's American Liberty with Bill Lockwood. That's a YouTube channel. Writing for the Bible brand. That's another YouTube channel. And then American Liberty with Bill Lockwood.com. That's the web address. And the shows are uploaded there. Amazing. Thank you, Bill, very, very much. It was amazing. I hope I didn't hold you over too long. And uh, no, it's, okay. it's, great. it's great. good to talk with you. Thank you, buddy. I appreciate it. We'll talk yes, again soon. All right, Lord bless your work, Jesse. Thank you very much. You too, Bill. Amazing. Uh -huh. Bye bye. Bye now. Amazing. And don't forget to like, follow, tweet, subscribe, and share the Jesse Lee Peterson radio show, folks. We really appreciate it. We are at war. It is a spiritual battle for the soul of America. And it's going to take all of us to do it.